All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. Today is a special treat for everybody listening. We have a guest on today who I have been admiring for a few years now. She is just one of the most optimistic and infectious people on planet Earth. She's a mom, she's a boss, she's a, a mentor, a leader, an author, a speaker, a motivator, and just truly, I, I want to say she's the queen of nice. Today, we have Allison Absey joining us from her little school out in Michigan. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Wow, that was quite an introduction. I actually, I always want to record these things and play them for my teenage sons <laughs> like, guys, did you know I'm actually the queen of nice? So when you think I'm like horrendous asking you to clean up your rooms, like, no, I'm actually just really nice. <laughs> right. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you there completely. So feel free when we're all done. Give me something that I can record for my kids. Okay. Can just for yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It'll be a symbiotic yeah. thing. All right. Uh, Allison, there might be a few people out there for some crazy reason who don't know you. I don't really know how that's possible but there might be one or two people on planet earth. Do you mind just introducing yourself to those people? Let them know who you are, what you do. Yeah. So I'm an elementary principal, but I have been a principal for 16 years of all the levels. So elementary, junior high and high school. I'm a mom to two sons. I had my son Tyson is 13 and my son Lane is 18. And my husband's name is Jim and we live in a house in the middle of the woods in Grand Haven, Michigan, which is um, right on the coast of Lake Michigan. I'm a principal in Zeeland, Michigan, which is close to Grand Rapids for a frame of reference, so in West Michigan. And I am passionate about helping others discover the best in themselves. And I'm passionate about contributing to others' journeys and embracing every day, making every day a day to celebrate rather than a day to get through. And I just hope to have a positive impact, first of all, on the people who are in my day-to-day -day life. Like I want them to leave my presence better than when they entered my presence. Um, and then it's really cool like to meet people like you, Dave, and like expand that reach and be able to be inspired and influenced by people across the state, in the country, in the world, and, um, you know, have a, it feels like a, a relationship. Like, I feel like we are friends and we've never even met face to face. It's, it's crazy. I, I know. I, I feel the exact same way. Um, and I, I'll tell you, you do an amazing job. You, you say one of your goals is to bring out the, the beauty in others. And just a, a little aside, people might not know this, but I actually reached out to you and said, hey, I, can you just like, be a mentor to somebody that's working in, in my district? And you said, sure, absolutely. Never met you before, Dave. Um, never really <laughs> had a real conversation with you before, Dave. But yeah, I'd be happy to. And you did. You just picked up the phone and started running with it. You're, you are happy to help anybody at any time. And I, I so appreciate that about you. And well, thank you. I feel the take, same way about you. Take, taking the whole um, beauty, beauty inside of themselves thing to another level. Let me pay you a compliment real quick. Um, following you on social media and checking out your fitness journey right now. Look yes. at you killing life right now and just <laughs> shining like crazy. Oh, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I am on a journey for sure. And, you know, we all reach these like crossroads or pivotal points in our lives. And I'm at one right now. I'm at, uh, I've like, I've crossed the crossroad and embraced um, just a, a new approach to life over the course of the past 75 days through this 75 hard challenge. And it's, it's been a piece of uh, rebuilding some like self-confidence and self-care. And then also it's been a physical transformation and it's also been a spiritual transformation. And I feel like we could talk on and on and on about any one of those aspects, but we're going to talk as, as, as we continue through some of those pivotal moments in that we come to in our lives and, and, you know, embracing that opportunity for change and then taking our lives to the next level at, in those moments. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you, you shared a few of those. It's almost like foreshadowing here. You can tell you're an author, you throw those little nuggets out there just so we can <laughs> latch onto them. It, one of the things I appreciate, appreciate about you is your perspective on life, but you said something in there that 
I wouldn't have expected you to say. You, you mentioned it's been this transformation of self-confidence. I, I, I picture you as somebody that just has this amazing perspective on all people, including yourself, and always sees the good. So for example, you mentioned that you live over in Grand Haven for people that aren't familiar with Michigan, right on the coast of Lake Michigan. I live in Michigan, but on the other side of the state. I picture where you live um, as beautiful two months out of the year. My perspective is, holy crap, is it cold there? The wind is always blowing, the snow is always flying, it's always icy. But you see it as beautiful. I live out in the woods and I've got nature <laughs> and the lake. And is that is that truly how you always see life? Are are you yes. rainbows and yeah? I do. I am rainbows and sunshine, except inside, like toward myself. Mm. And I I I really work hard not to take struggles that I'm having out on the people around me. Like I really want to be a light in everyone else's life. So that's probably why you don't see those internal struggles as much. I try to be transparent in my writing, but in a, a positive way to, you know, peel the curtain and, and show that like even those of us who approach life in a positive, like I embrace all the seasons. I love all the seasons. Like it is freezing today. And I don't know if I want to work out in the dark and the cold later on today. Um, but I might, and I'll feel better after I do it. So, um, I, I don't complain about things. I see the glass is half full, but I, I'm really hard on myself. Like so many of us. Mm. It's, it's interesting. You've been on this, this journey. I mean, your books are all about serendipitous moments and things just always happen for the right reason. But your journey to where you are right now hasn't all been rainbows and sunshine. I mean, you can no. look at it now and say you are where you are now and you're supposed to be here. But right. can you just take us through a little bit of that journey that, that led you to this moment in time? Yeah. So, you know, they say that you write the book that you need. Right. And that's absolutely true with me. Like the lessons that I wrote about first in the path to serendipity um, and then continued on and through the lens of serendipity. And then even in the serendipity journal, which is the book that just came out, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, all of those lessons are things that I need to remind myself, not just on a daily basis, but like a moment to moment basis in order to be the person that I want to be for everyone around me. And they also, like Brene Brown, I think is um, the one who talks about, like we can, we can be vulnerable and talk about things that have been really difficult in our lives if we've processed through them. Right. And there are some things in my life, like, you know, losing my mom or um, just some challenges that I've gone through and like professional positions that I have processed and I can talk about. And there's some other challenges in my life that I will not talk about maybe Ever because either they hit too close to home and I'm not willing to be that vulnerable about them or because talking about them might hurt some people I love. And so, I, and I don't want to hurt anybody that I love. So um, yeah, there's definitely been challenges that have shaped me as a person, but I can't remember the exact quote. I truly believe that the most beautiful people are people who have been through really deep challenges and have come out the other end and they can express just beautiful empathy toward others and really understand the depths of others' emotions. But also understand that the day-to-day -day stuff that we go through, the hardships that we go through, they're so temporary. And they're not pervasive. Like they don't affect every area of our lives. And if we can keep problems as small as possible, they're solvable. So understanding that, you know, go going through significant challenges helps us understand that most of the stuff we go through is pretty minute. That's powerful. You keep it as small as possible and it's manageable and you can, you can overcome it. When, when you look back on your, your career, we'll just, we'll just stay in that lane right now. Yeah. Um, has it has it been a smooth trajectory to where you are right now? <laughs> You're already chuckling because for for nobody, I mean, nobody has that smooth trajectory. But outside looking in, people look at you and say, "You just you have it all, right?" I mean, author, speaker, leader. It, it it's got to just be easy for you. You've just <laughs> fell into all this amazingness, right? Oh, I mean, like, where do you even start? That was a huge question. So. Um, you know, just like every educator, well, first of all, my journey started as hating school as a student. 
And I, there are some educators who are like, I love school and I wanted to be a teacher since I was in kindergarten. And then there's others of us who um, are in this profession because we want it to be different than how it was for us. Like, I didn't like school in any, like from kindergarten on through 12th grade, I graduated saying, I don't know what I want to be, but I know I don't want to be a teacher because I never want to step foot in a school again. And I really don't even want to go to college. I, w I wished I wanted to, like I had a couple of my friends who went to trade school. I really wished I saw a trade for myself and I could just go to trade school, get, you know, the six months training and then go out into my career. But I, I, I didn't want any of that. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to go to college. And I fell into education. I started going, I went into business and I fell into education because one of my high college classes was canceled just a general psychology class. And I had to pick up a class that would fulfill that same requirement. And that was my sophomore year in college. And I picked up educational psychology because it fit into my schedule and because it fit into the requirement. And the teacher at the, the first day of class said, all right, everybody who is going into education, raise your hand. This is Grand Rapids Community College, fall of my sophomore year of college. And everybody in the room raised their hand except for me. But I still had to do the same volunteering in a classroom as everybody else because I had to, you know, fulfill the requirements of the class. And that's where things changed for me because I got into a classroom and I looked around at, I always call it like those snotty faces of these first graders. And I thought, I don't want you to feel about school the way that I felt after 12, 13 years in school. I want things to be different for you. And the only way I can make things different for you is by being that person. And that's why I became a teacher. Do, do your own personal boys, your own sons, how do they feel about school? Do they resonate with it? Do they love it? Or do they have your traits? <laughs> <sighs> yeah, they have my traits, unfortunately, and they have my husband's traits. Yes. <laughs> They're like, they were screwed from birth. So, so yeah, how do you, no. <laughs> they're great. They're great boys, like, but they don't like school. I got so how do you balance that? Uh, especially knowing that the career you're in right now um, versus your own past experiences, mindset. I mean, it, it's got to be a, a difficult, slippery slope at times, right? Like with my own children? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I figured out, I turned out pretty good and I hated school through 12th grade. I think they're going to be okay. Um, that's like one mindset, right? Uh, I wish it would be different for them, but they're experiencing this, you know, the same kind of challenges that I experienced. Um, but I also feel like it's really important that they become good people and they pursue passions and feel strongly uh, about learning and uh, being creative and problem solving. So that's where I think, you know, my focus really is on, on helping. Like this is like, I look at this as like, it's the long haul, right? Like I don't want them just to be successful in school. I want them to be successful in life. So I look at the, 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 the end game. And that's, that's leadership right there. Yeah, it's leadership <laughs> and parenting. It's hand in hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question. Maybe there, it's an impossible question. But knowing that you are um, an amazing mom, who's, you're focusing on the right things. You're focusing on the, the skills and the heart more than a, a bunch of other stuff that ultimately you and I know probably won't make or break anybody. You have also taught uh, junior high, middle school, uh, been a, a leader of junior high, middle school, and at the high school level. What's the hardest role you've ever had to fill as an adult? So we go into education to work with children, and then we become leaders of adults, many of us. And that's what I am now. I'm a leader of adults. Like it is one, I love my students at Quincy. And it is wonderful to walk down the hall and like have to peel them off me because they want hugs. And, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be loved by them. But really my job is to be the support that teachers need me to be in order to do their best job. And then, and of course, like I have a role with our families, you know, our, our parents and guardians and supporting them. But my role in that way is more auxiliary because I don't have that day-to-day -day direct interaction with our parents and our students like teachers do. So my direct support is with teachers. 
Okay. And so I'm going to circle back to your question. And you said, what's the hardest role in education? And, and like, we can excuse like bad kid behavior because they're kids. It is more difficult to excuse adults who are um, behaving in a way that's hurtful to each other. And sometimes that might be families, like parents of our students. Sometimes that might be staff members. That has been the, the most difficult to me. And I'm also like, I have this mindset of like, wait a minute, our job is to help things be easier for each other and help lighten each other's loads and, and be a light and sunshine in each other's days. And not everybody has that same philosophy. <laughs> so that is that navigating that is a challenge. And it's a challenge that I work really hard to um, support and overcome. Um, but that probably has been one of my biggest challenges as an educator. I think that's hard for, for anybody to navigate, whether they're in education, the business world, a, a parent is the mindsets of people when they don't, they don't see the world the same way that we do. And it, it's hard to rationalize. It's hard to use logic to try to get inside of their head and their heart and figure out how in the world can they, can they not see what I'm seeing? But yet you, you're right. Your, your challenge right now is to work with adults. You know, there's a lot of people out there that make the claim that the job of every educator is to always do what's best for students. And I agree with that. I know you agree with that. But I think oftentimes people use that as an excuse and then dump on teachers and say, well, it's best for kids. So we're going to make the lives of teachers harder or more miserable or whatever. I think you find that, that perfect balance. And I heard you say your job is to support the teachers because you know that they're the ones that make an impact on the students. Right. Um, and, it, and I also trust them as professionals yeah. who make decisions based on what's best for kids when that's like the culture, the overall culture. Yeah, that, that's powerful. So, you know, I know that you are wise, that you are smart, that you are dynamic. When did you start to realize that you had a message that could resonate beyond your school walls? That was like one of those crossroads in, in life. Um, so I spent my first 11 years as a principal, like isolated. I had a team in my district of leaders that I would work with. And then we'd have like a problem. Superintendent would say, hey, Allison, like I've identified this issue, go solve it. And I would literally go into my office and close the door and like rack my brain. Mm -hmm. And I look back on that and I think that's the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would talk with teachers and try to like get input within the school building and that's smart. But to think that I had to solve these problems from my brain is so dumb because there are so many resources out there. And yes, once in a while, I have a good idea that comes just from my brain. But most of the time, the ideas that come just from my brain are dumb. But um, And that's okay. Like We'll throw out all the, the ideas on the table and some of them stick and some of them don't. But I have learned so much from really smart educators around my state and around the country and around the world. And so being a connected educator was pivotal. And so I became connected. And at the same time, I started blogging. And I love to write. I always love to write. Like, it, I have like, always been the one like, Allison, could you wordsmith this? Or Allison, could you write this email? Because you're going to be able to say it. Teachers would ask me all the time, like, how do I say this to a parent? And, and so that's something that came pretty easily for me. So I started blogging and like I just started connecting with other educators through that. Some of my ideas were, they liked them. And some of the ideas, like two people read my blog, you know, it's just some resonated and some didn't, and that was okay. And I just felt like there was more in me with writing. And so I started writing a book and how that became the path to serendipity is an um, yeah, interesting story. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about that story because it is, it's an interesting story. It's a powerful story as well. Um, the idea of uh, even serendipity. I mean, it, it sounds like a Mary Poppins type word, you know, serendipity, serendipitous, yeah. everything is serendipitous, but it truly is. Get, t take us on that journey. What, what was the path to serendipity? Okay, so the, 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 I, the fascination with serendipity because, okay, the names of my books are The Path to Serendipity, The Princes of Serendip, 
through the lens of serendipity in the serendipity journal. And then we also have a fifth, which is my serendipity journal, which is a, an actual like journal that kids can write in. Okay, so th those five books, they all have the name serendipity in them. So we're sensing a pattern here, or maybe an obsession. <laughs> so um, I became fascinated with the idea of serendipity when I watched the 2001 or 2000 John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale movie called Serendipity. Serendipity. That's it. Yes. And I actually was teaching seventh and eighth grade at the time. And I was teaching a character education class. And um, I didn't want to call it character education because the kids would be like, okay, like they would not be into it. I didn't think if I just called it character education. And uh, um, so I wanted to call it something catchy. So I called it serendipity. So that was like the, that, that's where I first used that name. And then when I started my blog, like I always, fast forward, you know, 14 years or something like that. I started my blog and I thought, oh, maybe I'll call it serendipity in education. I remember talking to one of my secretaries. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm making this blog and I'm thinking about calling it serendipity in education. Is that dumb? You know, thinking like it was too like cheesy or too Mary Poppinsy, but it's so me. It just, that is what it is. Yeah. Now, do you, do you, did you get obsessed with the word because of just the way it sounds? Um, or because of the actual depth and meaning behind the yeah. word. Yeah, Be because I saw it as, so serendipity, I, I, when I speak to groups of educators, I say, who knows the definition of serendipity? And most of the time, nobody knows what it means. Right. And it means happy accidents. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, in, to me, the, the idea, I don't even know, like instantaneously, the idea became more than just happy accidents. It became looking for happy accidents throughout our lives, that we will live richer, more fulfilled, and wiser lives if we look for happy accidents, the beautiful lessons in everything we experience. And, and from like sorrows that um, we would never expect to happen in our lives, like tragedies, to joys like beyond our imagination and then everything in between all of those experiences offer us something and we can choose to look for the gift they offer us or not that's up to us and that so like living with a serendipity mindset is living our lives looking for those beautiful lessons and everything we experience yeah it's it's so good it's it's one of those things that i think some people say that's eh, easier said than done you don't know what <laughs> i've been through though right i mean um my, my life has really been hard. And you alluded to the fact that yeah, you, you've had some things as well. I mean, you've gone through the things. You don't share all the things, but you've gone through the things, <laughs> yes. if you will. Um, and yet you've made it to the other side. What, what yeah. is the secret to being able to see it from the other side? Yeah, you know, I have gone through the things. I still go through the things. And life is going to happen. And there will be sorrows, tragedies in my life. And there will be joys beyond my imagination and all the things in between. Like, I know that's ahead of me. And, and like, we have a choice. Like, it is okay. People can choose to dwell in those sorrows or we can choose to say, you know, what, once we work through some of these strong emotions, because that's going to happen. And we have to give ourselves space to work through those strong emotions, whether it's anger or, um, sadness or fear, whatever the case is, work through those emotions, sit in them. And then once we're ready to move on, look at the situation and say, like, what can I glean from this? Mm -hmm. What lesson can I carry with me? And almost always, if we can't think of anything else, the thing we can carry with us is empathy for people who are going through the same thing. And that's a beautiful lesson. Absolutely. No, that's really good. Uh, at what point did you realize that your blog uh, so you mentioned that you, you started writing this blog and, um, and at times two hits, four hits, whatever. <laughs> at what point did you say, okay, I'm turning that into a book and it's going to be a book with DBC. At DBC, for those that aren't really tracking, everybody knows DBC, Dave Burgess Consulting. Um, at what point did you say, I'm, I'm taking that leap. I'm going to throw it out there for mass consumption because you know the world reads this now. At what point did you say, uh, something here? Um, yeah, so... 
I was listening to a podcast that actually, it was a hack learning podcast that Connie Hamilton was on. And she just said Another something. Another Michigan girl. Yeah. Yes. Woo -woo. <laughs> West Michigan. She just said something that stuck with me. She said, if you have an idea for a project or a book or whatever it is, like go for it, reach out to someone, see if they'd be interested in partnering with you on that idea. And so I took that, that feedback to heart and I, I reached out to Dave and Shelley and said, Hey, I have this idea for a book. And they're, they, Dave and Shelley are so gracious. They're like, yes, we'll do um, a Google Hangout. I'm going to talk to you about like our philosophy of the books that we publish. Go ahead. Like, we like your idea. Go ahead. We're not sure like exactly if it's going to work for us, but go ahead and, and, you know, write this amount for us and then send it back. And then we'll do another Google Hangout. And then they said no to me. So, um, and then, and that was okay. Um, that project is still like just sitting on the shelf. And then fast forward, I don't even know, it was probably like six months later, I had started working on another project and that is the path to serendipity because I was talking with a friend of mine and my husband and they're like, Al, just write your heart. Just go write your heart. Like you, you keep saying you have this in you and you're not sure if it's this direction or this direction, just go write your lessons, write your heart. And I just started and I thought, okay, if the only people who read this are my sons and their future wives and their families, like that's, that's enough. That's worth this time for me. And so I kept writing and I, I, I created this, um, celebrate Monday video it just kept writing and sharing and like learning from others. And I create videos. I, I mean, like if you know me at all, you know my face because I take selfies all the time and take videos of myself. Um, and Dave Burgess contacted me after my Celebrate Monday video and back in 2017 and said, hey, like we really need to do something together. And so I actually, I said, well, Dave, this is a Twitter message, Dave, by the way, I actually am working on a new project, a book. Here it is. And I sent him a link to the Google doc and then I heard nothing. <laughs> like, he's like, oh, this is cool, Allison. And then, yeah, nothing. And so, um, I'm persistent. Uh, I just have learned that like, you know, in poker, in basketball, like I don't have skills sometimes, but persistence and patience can pay off in all of those um, settings. So I continued working on the book and I messaged Dave again and said, Hey, just want to let you know, I'm, I made some updates and sent it to him. And, and we just like went back and forth a little bit like that till finally I got an email from Shelly saying, we want to publish your book. And I'm like, what, 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 this was a Twitter message in a Google doc, like what? So she had just been off on a little retreat to read their manuscripts and she, Dave sent her mine and she read it and she loved it. And that was in October of 2017 and became the, the published book on May 3rd of 2018. So that was the, the beginning of that journey. That's so cool. Again, um, serendipitous, you look at it, I wonder what would have happened had they taken that, that first project, which I doubt was, was titled serendipity in any way. No. Shape, or form. Um, and it would have taken you on a completely different path. I mean, obviously not down the path of serendipity, but would have taken you down a completely different path that we can never look back and predict and assume. But at the time, I'm sure when you got that rejection, you were yeah. devastated, hurt. I mean, this was something that you put your heart into and you have tremendous respect for Dave Burgess. And you're thinking, wow, He's, he's going to be looking at my stuff and then all of a sudden the no. And I, I'll, I'll just share this. I can completely relate. I have a very similar story with Dave Burgess. First of all, one of my favorite people on the planet, love him. Like I'm not just saying that in hyperbole and blown smoke, love the man. He rejected my first book too, but then he took the time to actually shape it and reshape it and reform it and the whole nine yards. But it, it's crushing to put your stuff out there and have it be rejected, whether it be by one person or by thousands of people. Right. So it, it's, it's amazing to me that you were willing to then take that next step and say, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to go back out there and I'm going to share this with the world. Was there a fear that once it was published, when it was in print that, okay, now it's just going to sit on everybody's shelf. So nobody's actually going to read it. Like at what point did you start to realize, okay, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
I'm actually making an impact. It's funny because I think my fear was more that they would read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, my fear, and I even wrote about it in the book, was that like, okay, you have a published book that's called The Path to Serendipity. Now, Allison, you're expected to be perfect. Yeah. And then, and then also I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to publish this book. I, there's even a chapter on my marriage and my marriage is not perfect. And I thought, oh, your life is going to implode. You're going to lose your job. You're going to get divorced. Like you're in, and you put the path to serendipity out in the world. And like, I had to work through all of those feelings because I am not going to be perfect. Perfect doesn't exist. It's never going to happen in my life. I am a real person with real feelings. I have a mission in life and I have a platform that I'm so blessed to have. Um, but I, that was, that was a bit of a journey. And I think that's where this last 75 day challenge, to be honest with you, like we're, we're almost two years later and I'm still maybe working through all of that while I'm still writing and, 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 and putting things out, you know, on one hand it is ultimate accountability because I have to live my life on a, in a day-to-day -day basis in the way that I reflect it in, on my blog and in the books and in videos. That's, that's important to me. So that's great accountability. But on the other hand, like it's, it's kind of scary too. Yeah. It, it, you talk about that. Now that it's out there, and I, I say that, and I know it, and that's just the, the basis, the platform. Serendipity is everywhere in all of its lenses. But now people do expect that from you, that people look at you differently than they did four or five years ago. You know, four or five years ago, it was okay to make a bunch of mistakes and just recover from them. But now people do look at you and they're looking for you to mess up and they're looking at to, to judge you a little bit differently. Is it hard to, to lead a school um, at the same time as being this other person to, to the rest of the world? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, so I was just reading through the results of our anonymous staff survey and <laughs> They're overwhelmingly positive, but you, I'm sure, just like me, where you zone in on those couple things that right. are not positive. And, and I, I was talking with my um, school improvement chairperson just before we got onto this podcast, and I actually used the S word. I don't swear all the time, but I just, I won't, <laughs> I won't we're use not the talking serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> no. S-H. Um, so when, and I won't use it on the podcast, but I just said to him, like, I can have people on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, be like, oh my gosh, Allison, you're incredible. Like I could ha have you, Dave, tell me that I'm incredible, but I am nothing. Th that means S-H-I-T, right? <laughs> Unless what's happening at Quincy Elementary is the same thing. I'm, like, I'm going to try my best to appreciate that because I do think you're incredible. So I'll, I'll put that out there just so you know, but I understand what you mean. My, my opinion doesn't matter as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it is, it is a, it's a challenge, but you know, there, there's so many things that are really more head games than anything else. So if we can stay out of our own stinking heads, like we can move through life a lot easier. And so, and I think about myself a lot more than anybody else thinks about me. Yeah, it, it, that's so spot on. And at times we think everybody's thinking about us and everybody cares what we think or what we're doing. But in reality, most people really don't. That's, that's, that's no. Right yeah. Um, can, I, can I take the, the next step of, of serendipity here? So you, you put one book out there. It was awesome. Rock and roll. And then you thought, I've got more ideas, more ways to, more lenses in which I need to, to share and celebrate this message. Um, what, what what is out there now in terms of the serendipitous lens? Um, like as far as books, is that what yeah, you mean? What, what is, yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with books, and how else are, can people tap into the message that you're you're delivering? Okay, yeah. So of course, like I researched the word serendipity, and the origin of the word is from a 16th century Persian tale, and it, that it's it's like kind of like a folk tale, mm -hmm. um, but I rewrote it. And Dave and Shelley published it as a picture book. And that's called The Princes of Serendip. And that's a social emotional journey that these three princes go on. Um, they learn these social emotional lessons and then ultimately learn this idea of serendipity of like, we learn really great 
important lessons as we work hard and treat each other well every day. And then my third book is called Through the Lens of Serendipity. It has the longest subtitle in like the history of subtitles. The subtitle is Helping Others Discover the Best in Themselves, Even If Life Has Shown Them Its Worst. And that book is... I mean, okay, like I'm so biased, but that book is a fabulous book for school staff because it takes the idea of trauma-informed care and applies that kind of in like a broad spectrum. So it, the, the, the book talks about the supports that those who have been impacted by trauma need, and then how can that positively impact everybody? Because we can uh, safely assume that everyone has been through at least challenges, if not trauma, and they all need to be treated with care and grace. And we can treat them better with care and grace if we understand the motivation behind their behavior, if we understand why they're doing what they're doing. So that's what through the lens of serendipity really unpacks is how can we help others discover the best in themselves by understanding them better and then understanding the impact of our behavior on them. So that's, that's the third book. And then the fourth book that just came out is called the serendipity journal. And this is my first fiction chapter book and it's for middle grade students, which is like grades four, five, and six. And um, it's a story of a character, like there's so many autobiographical and biographical components, but it's a story of a character. Her name is Kippley, which was my mom's name. And my mom passed away in 2012. Such a beautiful, unusual name. And I'm so proud to be able to, to use it in the book. So Kippley moves from Grand Rapids to Jackson. Jackson, are you near Jackson? Uh, no, I'm, I'm over by Flint and Saginaw area. So, okay. Yeah. Eh, okay. Jackson's yeah. like in the middle Jackson, of the state yeah. on the way to Detroit for me. Right. Gotcha. Kind of. Um, so then Kip goes through some challenges as a new sixth grade student at Jackson intermediate school. And then, um, so she make, she has a great teacher named Mrs. Holiday, who she journals back and forth with. And Mrs. Holiday teaches her some really valuable lessons about why people do what they do. Because Kip is also experiencing some bullying from a couple classmates. And then ultimately, it's a story of empowerment and taking control of a situation and asking for help when you need help. So um, I, that journey, I put chapters of that book out on a web, a blog, and had students from all over the world edit it and give me feedback on the story. And so I used their feedback and what they said they're looking for in character development in a, in a story. And I put that all in the serendipity journal. So um, I'm just starting to hear back from students about that, the story and, and from educators and how they're using it. So that's been, it's been phenomenal. That's so cool. That's so cool. I mean, you're, you're attacking this from, from every angle reaching every demographic possible is there is there anything in the works right now is there any person that has an excuse not to to read any of the stuff that you say oh I, i've got i've got the next thing for you now uh-huh. yeah so um i i i was just kind of like waiting to see like how it goes with the serendipity journal but i anticipate that there will be a, a sequel or two for that and like writing fiction chapter books for middle grade students is so different than writing like professional development books. Yeah, yeah. So I anticipate that there will be like another professional, my, my, my heart in as an educational leader is how to lead the whole teacher. Like how do we provide an environment that takes care of all the pieces of them so that we can um, keep educators in education <laughs> We can have them feel empowered and good and supported, and then we can recruit educators in, into um, our, our system. So that's my, my passion. It's been my passion. That was like my first book pitch to Dave and Shelley was a, a book like kind of on that idea. So at some point there will be a book that, that encompasses those concepts and I don't know who it's going to be with or, or where that, how that's going to unfold. But those are a couple of the directions. I, I think like at some point, like 20 years down the line, I might retire from education, but I don't know that I'll ever retire from writing as long as I can write because, and again, I'm like, I mean, look at me, like I'm so young, right? <laughs> I'm a long way from retirement, but um I I absolutely love writing. It's just a creative outlet and it's reflection and it's accountability and it's connection. And it's, um, you know, being able to like influence like a small 
part of the world in a positive way means everything to me. You know, you're making a, a huge impact to a big part of the world. So oh, thank you. Keep what you want it. And if, if not, you're at least changing me. So <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, true story. Um, I mean, you have, you've made an impact on me as a person just over the last four years, I would say. Um, just seeing your perspective and your lens on life. It, it truly does impact me when, whether it's reading stories to your Quincy kids uh, over holidays uh, to welcome them back or to just keep them engaged to um, celebrating your staff to just being real and being you and being goofy and singing your songs or whatever the <laughs> case may be. Um, it, it makes a difference and it resonates with a guy that used to just try to keep everything so close to the best and didn't want to share the real him. You help even bring somebody like me out of my shell a little bit and let me, let me realize it's, it's okay to just be real. So you, that's you're a huge it. honor. Thank you so much. You're doing it. You're doing it. So we covered a lot. We covered a lot of ground here. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Maybe you want to sum it all up. Maybe there's something else that we didn't cover that you want to make sure you throw out there. We call this the mic drop moment. It's your opportunity just to, to leave a lasting impact on the people that are listening and watching. Um, this is going to be what they remember from the entire thing. No pressure here. Oh my but, gosh, I know. <laughs> and you've got the entire world listening, Allison. Just know that. <laughs> Every single person on the planet is listening to this. So what do oh. you know? Drop that mic. Right. So I, I have to share something that's just like close on my heart right now. Um, and I just wrote a blog post about it that like, you know, maybe two people read or something, but the blog post is called, I am but a wisp. Mm. And it's this idea of like, I have four books out and I will have no legacy beyond my grandchildren or maybe my great grandchildren. Like the world is not going to remember me. And in the, that big picture of things, I'm insignificant. And that could be disheartening, but for me, it is liberating. And it's the idea of I am living for today and to be the best I can be to, for myself and for everyone around me today. And not even really for tomorrow, of course, as leaders, like we have planned for tomorrow and like, but, but what's most important is what's right in front of me today. And that's the only way I can keep like all these balls in the air. That's the only way we all can like be our very best is to, to focus on what's right in front of us. You know, I think about even working, getting up at four 30 this morning and working out, I'm not working out this morning for what's the result in six months. I'm working out this morning for the result today of how I feel about myself, the energy level that I have, and just really trying to zone in on today because who knows if tomorrow is even going to exist. And that's been over the 75 day challenge, ironically, and through um, just embracing my spirituality in a different way. That's been one of the, the, biggest life-changing lessons for me right now. I am at a crossroads. Again, I feel like I've, I've crossed it and um, moving in a new direction in my life. Just like when I started blogging and becoming a connected educator, that was life-changing, not just professionally, but also personally. Like it, it gave me a, a platform and this opportunity to believe in myself in a way that I never had. Now I have this, I feel like now I'm in this place where I'm settling into myself in a way I've never had that really allows me to embrace this idea of living for today. That, that might be the mic drop moment of all mic drop moments. Aww. I mean, it, it resonates so much. Um, you know, I think so many of us, myself included, maybe I'll just speak for myself, not for everybody else. We get caught up in this rat race where we're so focused on the next best thing always looking for the grass to be greener, always looking for the next opportunity, um, that we lose sight of where we are right now. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic because I've told people before, the greatest piece of advice I've ever gotten was to never begin a sentence with, I can't wait until. <laughs> but yet that's not the life I live. You know, right. it's, I think so many of us just get caught up in whether it's planning for retirement or planning for, as an administrator, I used to hate it when teachers would say, I'll do that next year. Um, just focus on this moment right here, because this is the moment that matters most. When you're having a connection with somebody, look them in the eye because they're there with you in this moment. All the other stuff is insignificant. 
That's good stuff, Allison. That's that's why you're changing the world right there. Ah, well, thank you. Amazing. It's you know, it's changing me, right? And then I just have this this platform. Like, thank you for having me on the podcast, and just to even be able asking the questions and being open ended and being able to share that. Like, that is um, that's a, a incredible gift. So, thank you for that. Absolutely, you are you are the gift. So, I appreciate you. I appreciate all that you're doing for everybody, yourself included, and taking us along your journey because it's a good one. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for all that you do. And um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm proud to be connected with you. So thank you. Absolutely.